All right. Well, we're, I, today I'd like to finish talking about perception. Uh, there's so much to say, but I think the basic, I, I think I've succeeded in, in covering the basic uh, questions in uh, lecture. <clears throat> and just to summarize it very briefly, uh, there are really two parts uh, to the presentation I've been making. There is the traditional problems of perception, which are part of epistemology. And there, the big question is always to try to state the relationships between our conscious perceptual experiences and the so-called external world. And the, the tacit assumption that gives that uh, problem a right, particular skeptical bite is the assumption that you never directly perceive the external world. All you directly perceive are your own inner experiences and then there are a whole lot of uh, different answers to the question, what's the relation between the experiences that you do perceive and the object you don't perceive? And uh, uh, all of the answers are bad, uh, but uh, one answer is, well, the object, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the sense datum that you do perceive is kind of a picture of the object. Uh, that won't do. Uh, and then another answer is, well, whether there isn't anything to the object. It's that the world just is sense data. That's all there is. That's the idealist or phenomenalist picture. And that, believe it or not, had a kind of enormous influence in the 20th century. What was put in a linguistic mode, uh, people said, well, really what we mean is not, we're not denying that the world is made of uh, atoms and molecules. What we're saying is any statement about the world is equivalent to a set of statements about experiences, about sense data. And this seems to um, fit in well with the scientific philosophy of the uh, empiricist tradition, of the tradition out of Locke, Berkeley, and, and Hume, uh, that says science is founded on our sensory experiences, on our ability uh, to uh, perceive objects and states of affairs. But if we're going to be strict empiricists, then any statement about the real world, any empirical statement must be equivalent in meaning to a set of statements about sense data. And that deals with the question, well, how do you, how does the sense datum theorist deal with objects when they're not being perceived? And the answer is that on the sense datum uh, theory, the statement, uh, there is an uh, object, uh, there's a tree in the quad when no one is around to look at the tree. That's equivalent in meaning to a set of hypothetical statements. If we go into the quad, we will see such and such sense data. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the, it, the phenomenalist tradition tied in nicely with the linguistic philosophy of the middle of the 20th century, and it was surprisingly influential. And as I told you last time, it's an amazing fact about the history of philosophy that none of the great philosophers were naive realists. Now, I uh, try to defend naive realism against the attacks, and I, as I think, as I said, it's not really an exaggeration to say uh, that the greatest disaster in epistemology, and I think the greatest disaster in philosophy, was the rejection of the idea that you can actually perceive objects and states of affairs directly. Well, if you accept that view, my view, then uh, what are the components of the perceptual situation? Well, I think they're fairly obvious. There's the perceiver, the object or state of affairs perceived, the conscious visual experience, we're talking about vision now, the conscious visual experience and the set of causal relations whereby the impact of the object on your nervous system in the form of reflected light waves or photons on your nervous systems causes in you the conscious visual experience. Now what binds those four elements together that gives us a coherent account of perception is the intentionality of the perceptual experience. You cannot begin to understand perception unless you understand the intentionality of the perceptual experience. But it is unlike the, the, some of the philosopher's favorite forms of intentionality, for example, belief and desire, in that it gives you a direct presentation of the conditions of satisfaction. It's not something detached from the condition of satisfaction. 
you have an immediate and direct presentation of the object or state of affairs that you are perceiving. Uh, anyway, uh, that's uh, 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 the, uh, uh, the account of perception that I gave you then divides into two parts. There's my discussion of the philosophical tradition uh, with its uh, sense datum obsession. And as I said, that was put in uh, different jargon sometimes, impressions, ideas, representations. But the idea of the sense datum tradition is that all you ever, strictly speaking, directly perceive are your own experiences. And I've discussed that at some length. But I think the more important part of the subject is what I covered first, namely the intentionality of perception. What's special about perception? And it's fair to say that uh, very few contemporary philosophers really understand. So the whole confused uh, theory of, I, I told you it was called disjunctivism. It's an ugly word, but anyway, uh, disjunctivism rests on a failure. Uh, to see, to understand the intentionality of visual perception. And I know because I asked the local disjunctivists, well, what's your account of the intentionality of visual perception? They haven't got one. Uh, they have to say, well, it doesn't have intentionality. There's just a direct causal relation uh, between you and the object when you see it. Well, of course, there's a direct causal relation, but also uh, that direct causal relation causes in me a conscious visual experience of the object. Now tell me about that conscious visual experience, and you'll find the only way to describe it is intentionalistically. In a way, the single most important fact about perception is that the description of the perception and the description of the world perceived is exactly the same. So you can say either, what do you see? I see my hand in front of my face. Now describe your visual experience. I'm seeing a hand in front of my face. They're the same description. Now, it's true. If I'm going to be real cautious when I'm describing the visual experience, I'd say things like, well, I seem to be seeing a hand in front of my face. Who knows? Might be a hallucination or one of the philosopher's favorites. But all the same, the description uses exactly the same vocabulary in the same order. Why? How can that be? The visual experience is entirely in the head and the object and state of affairs perceived is out in the world. So the visual experience is in here, but the object is out there. How can I use the same words in the same order? I now see a hand, that's the external world, or inside my head, it now seems to me exactly as if I'm seeing a hand. How can I use the same words in the same order? And you all know the answer to that, because the intentionality of the visual experience gives you a presentation of the conditions of satisfaction. So describing the conditions of satisfaction, the real features of the world, and describing the intentionality of the visual experience, we'll use the same jargon, we'll use the same terminology. You can say either there's a hand there, or it seems to me exactly as if there's a hand there. And one describes what's going on in the world, and the other describes what's going on in your experience. And that's not surprising, because of course, evolutionarily speaking, the whole point of experience, the purpose of experiences, is to give us a direct access to the world. Now, there's one final topic I have to mention in passing. I've been talking about it at various points, uh, but I, I want to emphasize it, and that is you won't understand human perception unless you understand the role of the network and the background. The temptation is to think, well, what re we really perceive are colors and shapes. Um, uh, but of course, if you're talking about the actual experience, it takes a lot of effort to just try to see colors and shapes. You almost never see colors and shapes. What you see are people, objects, houses, uh, 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 cities, uh, airplanes, trees. I, I'm sitting upstairs in my uh, study looking out at San Francisco Bay. What do I see? I see the city of San Francisco. Yeah, but how about the colors and the shapes? I have no idea what the shape of San Francisco is. I mean, that's definitely San Francisco there on the horizon. And what shape is it? Well, it's kind of San Francisco shape. Uh, but uh, I, I, I am in using my network and background when I say I see the city of San Francisco. Now I can drag poor Gilbert up and point his eyes in the direction of San Francisco. Guess what? He doesn't see San Francisco. I have no idea what he does see, but I know he's not thinking, oh my God, uh, the city's half shrouded in its usual mist. Even Gilbert doesn't think that. 
I, and I gave you various other examples about the network in the background. I, I won't, I'll spare you the duck rabbit um, because you're bound to see it again before the end of the semester. But um, Gilbert can't see a duck rabbit because he hasn't got the uh, perceptual, uh, he hasn't got the background abilities to organize his perceptual experiences as this is a representation of a duck and this is a representation of a rabbit. In fact, after being just a, a puppy, Gilbert doesn't even pay any attention to mirrors. Uh, I mean, he, either he doesn't see the doggy in the mirror or he's lost interest in that uh, doggy. But we have a certain set of background abilities that gives us in, an enormously sophisticated organization of our perceptions. And the general rule, the single most important principle is, in general, intentionality rises to the level of the background skill. You don't just put the weight on the downhill ski, you execute a turn to the left. Or if you're a, a racer, you try to get close to the solemn gates. And remember what the coaches tell you. The coaches don't tell you things like, put your weight on the downhill ski. If they have to tell you that, you shouldn't be racing. Uh, what they, uh, you know, as if you're starting a tennis match, the coach doesn't say, now be sure you hold the ball in your left hand, the racket in your right hand when you start the serve. If the coach has to tell you that, you probably shouldn't be at Forest Hills in the national championship. So your intentionality will rise to the level of the background skill. And what the coaches say are things like, try to hold your speed in the, uh, in the flush so that you can keep going fast over the flats. Go into your tuck uh, as soon as you get in the flats and, and try to be going as fast as you can when you hit the big blue gate on the left. That's what they'll tell you if it's a giant solemn race. Now all of that is the cases where the intentionality is rising to the level of your ability. Uh, uh, similarly, when you uh, uh, see something, when you watch a movie or look at a painting, uh, you don't have to uh, see colors and shapes, uh, but you have to see uh, the forest uh, that appears on the left in which the figures in the foreground uh, appear to be exceptionally small because they're contrasted with the size of the forest in the background. I'm, I'm thinking of 19th century painting here. Uh, so in every case, I mean, think about your experience right now. You see me, uh, and you, uh, you don't ask, well, what color uh, uh, pants did he have on, because you're not focusing on that. You can focus on that, but in general, your intentionality will rise to the level of your background abilities. Think of hearing people talk. You never say of somebody uh, who's speaking the way I'm speaking, gosh, it sounds like English, uh, because you can all speak English. But if you don't speak French, you might hear somebody and you think, yeah, it sounds like French, or it sounds like they're speaking German or Chinese. I'm famous for not being able to speak Chinese, and so I'm embarrassed when I go to China if I learn any Chinese. I have a hell of a time with a tonal bit. We got to Shanghai, and I asked my uh, translator, well, is it hard for you to understand these guys in Shanghai? Oh, he says, terrible, I can't understand a word they say, because they pronounce all the words differently. And I said, well, for example, how they say Bu Yao. He said, oh, it's terrible. They say Bu Yao. Oh, I thought, that must be very tough. How they say Mayo. Oh, impossible. They say Mayo. Oh, I thought, you can't understand that. Well, of course, he hears subtle differences that I can't hear. Uh, uh, Mayo and Bu Yao were the two expressions I heard most commonly in China. As far as I can tell, Mayo means we don't have any, we're all out. And Bu Yao is what girls say. It means roughly speaking, please stop doing that. Um, uh, <laughs> now, <laughs> I'm just inferring uh, uh, from the, the context in which these utterances were made. Those of you who actually speak Chinese can correct my uh, translations here, but that's how, I, uh, I, I, that's how I, I, I would give you the translation. So I did accidentally learn a couple of expressions in Chinese, but not to speak of. Uh, all right, so now I'm going to drop a perception. This is your last chance to get in any, any questions about perception, and then we're going to go on, and I'm going to talk about internalism and externalism, a great contemporary debate. There's a guy at the back. Yes. Is it possible to see an object without, any, uh, without your perception shaped by the background and the network? 
if you're if it's a normal human perception you can't see anything without a background and a network now I don't know what his life is like for newborn babies my bet is that they have a great deal of um, I roughly speaking background capacities programmed into their brain but the idea that perception is just something that happens to you neutrally uh, that's not true and if you read these accounts by Oliver Sacks of people who had their vision, uh, who, who were born blind and had vision uh, uh, restored to them, it's virtually impossible uh, for them to see anything because the visual system has to be shaped by the experiences you have in the first few months of your life. And I, I don't know the literature on that, but my impression is that it's a mistake that we have that we think, well, the mind is just kind of a blank slate. And if you were born blind, uh, but then suddenly you got vision, uh, the world would look uh, to you as it does to everybody else. No, it doesn't. You have to, that visual system has to be trained to, uh, uh, to see, and it's very difficult uh, for people who are born blind and have their vision, have, have vision, I can't even say restored, but have the power of vision uh, imposed on them. It's very difficult for them to cope because their visual system has not been organized the way our visual system is organized. So the short answer to your question is, no background and network, no normal perception. Now, I don't want to say, well, you couldn't have uh, some kind of crazy disorganized uh, perception. Sure, you could. You could have stimulus of the visual system uh, without a normal human background, but it would be pathological. You wouldn't be able to cope. Your ability to cope with chairs and tables and cars and computers, all of that is, requires an enormously sophisticated set of background abilities. Okay, it's a good question. Yeah, this guy. Yeah, the, the picture that the philosophers give you, and I think it's useful even if it um, almost never happens, is that the whole idea of the hallucination is it should be exactly like the real experience. It should be exactly like seeing the real thing. Now, as I've said, I've never had a hallucination, I, so I don't speak from personal experience here, but, but it's a useful thought experiment. So the idea is that it's just exactly like seeing a real person in the doorway, but in fact it's a total hallucination. Now what is the correct description of the intentionality? The correct description of the intentionality is it's exactly the same as seeing a real person because uh, it has exactly the same uh, uh, experiential character, has the same phenomenological qualities, but that means it has exactly the same conditions of satisfaction. So you have a hallucination of seeing grandpa in the doorway, even when grandpa has been dead for 10 years. Uh, and the idea uh, of this imaginary hallucination, or, or this uh, case that I'm imagining, is the conditions of satisfaction are, I'm seeing grandpa in the doorway. It's exactly the same as the so-called veridical experience, because that's the whole point of this as a philosophical example is that the, the, there's nothing in the quality of the experience itself that distinguishes it from the real thing. In both cases, you have exactly the same conditions of satisfaction. Now, I think, in fact, that those kinds of hallucinations are very rare, but a very common kind of hallucination in pathology, I, in schizophrenia, are people who hear voices and I have to believe these people that they really do hear. I mean, that they do have the experience of hearing voices. And then they do these awful things because the voices tell them to do this stuff. That's right about the, uh, the pathology, isn't it? So a common type of hallucination is the auditory hallucination where you're uh, told to do things by voices that you hear. Okay, any other questions? Yes, at the very back, sh shout loud. <laughs> I'm not hearing you. <laughs> He's another teacher in this course, so he gets to come to the front of the room. So, um, for Locke, right, the secondary, yes. secondary qualities, you have ideas, but the, yeah. the world wouldn't really resemble them, right? That's right. It would be, so it would be whatever was going on in the world might be whirlwind corpuscles of some kind, but yes. um, they weren't red, like yeah. the ideas were. So what I was wondering is, what's the argument against somebody who said that um, it's a sense state of view, 
uh, you have ideas, but yeah. it, it's all like that. There's no resemblance between the, the sense data and the world. It's just, you know, they represent them in this causal way or something. So yeah. the red represents whatever's going on when I'm having these red ideas. Yeah, yeah so what's the, what's the argument against those? those well, if the uh, notion of represent there means conditions of satisfaction, uh, then it seems to me there's nothing wrong with saying uh, the condition of satisfaction of my experience are uh, that the object uh, I, uh, is a red basketball. And, and, and if there's no red basketball there, then you are mistaken. The condition of satisfaction aren't satisfied. The disaster, the, the mistake that I'm anxious for you to avoid is to, is to suppose that in all of those cases, this is, let's suppose this is the red basketball, in all of those cases, you don't see the basketball itself, but you only see the sense datum of the basketball. That's the view that I am rejecting. And what I'm saying is, no, when you see the basketball itself, you have in here an experience which has certain conditions of satisfaction. Name of the conditions of satisfaction are, there's a red basketball there, and it's causing me to have these perceptual experiences. So, the, I mean, I think Locke is right that there is a distinction between the primary and the secondary qualities. I don't much like the, uh, the version they give, but the idea is this. Ask yourself what fact in the world makes it true that the basketball is round. Uh, I mean, that's how it seems to you. And it's the particular shape of the basketball, namely the points on the surface are equidistant uh, from a common center. The molecules on the surface are equidistant from a common center. That's what it means to say it's round or circular. But what fact in the world makes it red is not in that way that it's red. The fact in the world that makes it red is it has the capacity to cause in you a certain type of experience. And if you have normal vision, you share that experience with other human beings. So there's an objective fact that it's red, epistemically objective, but redness is observer relative in a way that roundness is not observer relative. Take away all perceivers and you've taken away redness, but take away all perceivers and you didn't take away roundness, and that's the difference between the primary and the secondary qualities. Are you, I mean, have I answered your question? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Have another go at it. This is all of that. Uh, so, I thought that that was the disaster uh, about thinking of no, uh, a no. state was that. Well, you can't make sense of this resemblance relation between these things. That it's not a resemblance relation. Here is the point. When I say the conditions of satisfaction are that it's round and red, I'm not saying that the visual experience is a picture and the picture resembles how things are in the world. Intentionality is not resemblance. Yeah, yeah. Now, another way to describe the mistake that I'm militating against is people say, well, if you uh, saw a red object, then there must have been something red there, namely the sense data. And the idea is that the sense data is itself red. The experience is itself red, but that's crazy. Experiences don't have colors. Experiences are such that they have colors as their condition of satisfaction, but the experience is not itself red. You might as well say, if I lift a heavy object, then there must be two heavy things in the environment, the object and the experience of heaviness. The experience of heaviness isn't heavy, and the experience of red isn't red. Conditions of satisfaction are not matters of resemblance. Now, I'm glad you asked it, because it's absolutely crucial. When I say the condition of satisfaction of my present experience are that I have a piece of chalk in my right hand, I'm not saying, oh, well, I have this picture, and it resembles the actual chalk. Resemblance is irrelevant. There is no resemblance here. Yes? So, but I, I thought that was so, so disastrous about the um, sense data view yeah. was, look, you can't make sense if there's one car in the garage, and then there's another yeah. invisible one, and the other one yeah. looks like it is, right? So, but if you give up the idea that uh, they resemble, yeah. you, you don't have that problem. So what's so disastrous then about The that? disaster is simply this. We want to know how we relate to the real world. And the uh, sense datum theory makes it impossible to answer that question because it says you don't relate to the real world. The only real relation is to your sense data. And then there's a question, how do the sense data that you are related to, because you directly perceive them, how do they relate to the world that you can't perceive? 
And the history of Western philosophy is one headache after another going right through to Kant. And I read my summary of, I, of Kant, and in the very beginning I say, the real mistake in the book is on page 22 when he says, I'm going to talk about objects or representations neutrally. They're just the same for me. That's a disaster, because the object is not a representation. The object is an independently existing material object. So the reason I say it's such a disaster is it makes it impossible to solve the problem of skepticism initially, but worse yet, it really makes it impossible to give an intelligible account of how human beings relate to the world. Basically, all you're re really related to are your own inner experiences. Now, there's another problem I haven't mentioned, and it's a serious objection to any sense datum theory. How does it avoid solipsism? Because remember, the only sense data I can see are my sense data, but the only sense data you can see are your sense data. How do we get to be able to speak to each other? And it's very interesting to go through and see how the, uh, the, the uh, phenomena struggled with that problem. What they, one of them, Carnap, said, well, strictly speaking, you can't communicate the content of your experiences. You can only communicate the form of your experiences. So the red-green inversion case is a problem for them because it can't make any sense to say to them, I communicated to you the character of my experience because all I can do are use words that describe my own inner private sense data and you use words for your own inner private sense data. So that, but the nature of the disaster has two steps. First is epistemic. You can't solve the problem of skepticism. You can't solve Descartes' problem if you think that you never have direct access to how things are in the world. But secondly, you can't really give a, a, an intelligible account of how human beings uh, live their lives, how we live a life relating to other people and relating uh, to objects and states of affairs around us. Because strictly speaking, all we ever relate to are our own experiences. OK, I appreciate those questions. That's very helpful. All right, so let's go on now. Now we're going to go back to mainstream philosophy, and I'm going to tell you another great disaster. Um, and here is, I, I enjoy this one because it's another one of those issues where I'm very much in a minority. Maybe there's somebody who agrees with me, but it always makes me nervous if I find somebody who does. But anyway, let me tell you the view uh, that is opposed to me. I've been giving you an account of the mind where the mind is all in the brain. Uh, in fact, I, I'm perfectly happy to say mind-brain. It's the same phenomenon as far as I'm concerned. It's just the brain has a capacity that other organs doesn't have. Namely, it can produce this wonderful ontological subjectivity with conditions of satisfaction, and that enables us to cope with the world. Okay, but on this account, all of your mental life goes on in your head. And indeed, when, when you communicate with other people, you're able to communicate because the meanings in your head are the same as the meanings in this other person's head. Now, there's supposed to be a series of decisive arguments to refute this view. It's called, not surprisingly, internalism, because it says our mental life is internal to the brain. All right, I have gone over these briefly in response to a question by Jim uh, in an earlier lecture, but now we're going to go over it in low gear because this is an important issue in contemporary philosophy, and it's the kind of thing, ha, when you can't think of a more interesting question, you put it on the dumb final exam. So you're likely to see a question about this on the final because it makes a, a neat kind of question that you can ask and, and uh, uh, students are able to answer it or not able, as the case might be. Here's how the argument goes. Start with the meanings of words. Meanings cannot be in the head. Why? Because two people could have exactly the same thing in their heads and mean something totally different. And the decisive proof of that is the famous twin earth argument. And you remember how it goes, but it's always fun to repeat it. There is in a distant, distant galaxy a solar system that is exactly like our solar system, as philosophers love to say, down to the last molecule. Okay, now in that solar system, there is a twin Earth, exactly like our Earth, and on twin Earth, there's a twin Berkeley. 
And in twin Berkeley, there's a twin you, somebody exactly like you. Uh, and, and now, uh, so the story goes. Okay, so everything on Earth and twin Earth is exactly the same. However, there is one difference, and that is uh, the stuff that we call water on Earth turn out to be H2O. So water on Earth equals H2O. But on twin Earth, we'll have to call it twatter. They call it water. But twatter on twin Earth is a very complicated chemical formula, which we will abbreviate. Always be suspicious when philosophers tell us it's too complicated to write out. I'll just abbreviate it. But anyway, here's the abbreviation. It's X, Y, Z. Okay, so water on Earth equals H2O, but water on twin Earth, or twatter as we have to call it, is equal to X, Y, Z. Now, in 1750, your great-great-grandparents on Earth used the word, assuming they spoke English, used the word water to refer to water. But the great-great-grandparents of twin U on twin Earth used the word water to mean something different. They used the water to mean X, Y, Z and not H2O. But, and this is the key point, what's in their heads is exactly the same because in 1750 nobody knew any chemistry. In 1750, when somebody in, in well, there weren't anybody running around Berkeley in 1750, but let's say London. Uh, in London in 1750, somebody used the word water to refer to water. And in 1750, somebody on Twin Earth, in Twin London, used the word uh, twin water or twatter to refer to X, Y, Z. Same thing in the heads, different meaning. So the proof is meanings are not in the head. And the decisive argument is two people can have exactly the same thing in the head and still mean something different. I, when I tell you this, I, I feel like I, I, I'm, a, I'm busy trying to prove the existence of God using the ontological proof. I think it's a terrible argument, but it's very famous uh, in the literature and friends of mine believe it. Okay, so now Putnam, this is Hillary Putnam, uh, who is responsible uh, for the twin earth and I think I mentioned to you that Hillary once said to me that he's very depressed by the fact that his single most famous argument in his entire life is one he rejects oh well that's how it goes but anyway um, I, that's the twin earth argument now Putnam took away meanings it gets worse Burge took away belief you thought well maybe I can have my beliefs in my head even if my meanings aren't in my head. But Putnam summarizes his conclusion by saying, meanings just ain't in the head. Uh, they can't be, because what's in the head is insufficient. Meaning's supposed to fix reference. What's in the head doesn't fix reference. Now we get to Burge. Burge is going to tell us even beliefs aren't in the head. Here's how the argument goes. And again, I told you this earlier, but uh, one of the secrets of good pedagogy is don't be afraid to repeat things, even if you drive people crazy with boredom. So here's the repetition. There is a guy who goes jogging in uh, Santa Monica. Call him Tyler, just to have a name. Tyler goes jogging in Santa Monica, and he gets a terrible sore. Uh, so he goes to his doctor in Santa Monica, and he says, Doctor, I've got a terrible sore in my thigh. I think it's arthritis. Okay, now in Santa Monica, the doctors have reasonable education. They went to one of the uh, local, uh, one of the California medical schools, and so the doctor says, if it's a pain in your thigh, it can't be arthritis. Arthritis is an inflammation of the joints. By the way, we we'll imagine this is a doctor who knows some Greek uh, and can tell you, morphologically speaking, arthritis has to mean an inflammation of the joints because arth means joint and itis means inflammation. So arthritis has to be an inf inflammation of the joints. All right, but now 
It's the same guy. We're going to vary the examples. The same guy in the same situation as far as his pains are concerned, but he's in a different community. He's not in real Santa Monica. He's in twin Santa Monica. And he says to his doctor, doctor, I've been doing too much jogging. I've got a pain in my thigh. I think it's arthritis. But now in twin Santa Monica, they use the word arthritis differently. They use it to refer to muscle aches as well as joint inflammations. So the doctor in twin Santa Monica says to the same guy with the same pains, the doctor says, yes, we've been getting a lot of arthritis uh, in the thigh here in twin Santa Monica. Okay, now notice, you can't say there's a difference in the guy. It's the same guy with the same pain and the same history. He happens to be in two different communities, Santa Monica and twin Santa Monica. But in the case of the second uh, community, he holds a true belief. He truly believes that he has something he calls arthritis. But in the first community, he holds a false belief. He holds a false belief that he has arthritis. Now, it can't be the same belief. That's the same guy with the same thing in his head, but it must be two different beliefs because one belief is true and the other belief is false. Does everybody see that? You can't have the same belief being both true and false. So the belief in, in uh, twin Santa Monica, I, which he puts by saying, I have arthritis, I, is a true belief. The belief in Santa Monica, which he puts by saying, I have arthritis, is false. One and the same state of his head, two different beliefs. Now, what Putnam showed is that meanings are not in the head. What Bird shows is that even beliefs, and of course with beliefs everything, uh, fears and hopes and desires and all the rest of it, intentionality generally is not in the head. And the proof is decisive in both cases, because you can have exactly the same thing in the head and have a different meaning on earth and twin earth, and have a different belief in Santa Monica and twin Santa Monica. Same thing in the head, different beliefs, Therefore, beliefs are not in the head. Well, where are they? The account that Putnam gives says what really determines the meaning of the word is not in your head, but a causal chain that stretches from your utterance of the word back to an initial baptism, back when somebody originally baptized something as water. There's a causal chain, and water is defined as anything identical with that stuff, and that stuff happened to be H2O. But on Twin Earth, water is defined as anything identical with that stuff, and that stuff is XYZ. And in Burge's case, what Burge says is, what follows is that the individual doesn't get to decide what he or she believes. The community decides. And Burge even says this is anti-individualism that he is uh, defending. Individualism says you get to decide what your beliefs are. And Bird says my example proves it's the community that decides what your beliefs are because different communities give the guy different beliefs. Again, they must be different because one is true and the other is false. But the beliefs cannot therefore be in the head because what's in the head is exactly the same in both cases. The belief is a matter of not only what's in the head, but the relations to the community. Now, the general form of these arguments, and there are lots of others, but these are the two most famous arguments. The general form of the arguments is that the contents of the mind, or if you like, the contents of the brain, uh, because even the mind, it turns out, is not going to be in the head, I, the contents of the brain are insufficient to fix intentionality because what is in the head can be the same and the intentionality is different. All right, what do you think about those? Let's take questions about it. I want everybody to understand these arguments because these are famous arguments in contemporary uh, philosophy. And indeed, there is even a whole uh, a volume. If somebody at, reminds me, I'll put it on reserve in the house and library. It's called the Twin Earth Chronicles. Uh, in which there are a whole lot of discussions 
of the twin earth, including a, a piece by me that's in your reading, it's from, uh, including a, uh, I think there's a chapter uh, what's it, uh, are called Our Meanings in the Head. And my answer is yes, uh, but I'm opposed to the, uh, the mainstream. The mainstream accepts these, I think, accepts these arguments. I think they're bad arguments, but in any case, I'm gonna, I haven't told you why I think they're bad. Okay, questions about, yes. Yeah, I think Putnam is on to something right. Uh, namely, that the traditional account of meaning as sort of a checklist of general terms, uh, that's mistaken. I, I think that doesn't work. And in fact, if you look at the traditional definitions, they're pretty bad. Uh, I mean, water is traditionally uh, defined as a clear, colorless, tasteless liquid. Uh, well, it isn't really completely clear. It looks kind of waterish, and it isn't tasteless. Tastes like water, right? I mean, if it if this if I opened this thing, and it tasted like beer, where's my water? Ah, here I am with my twin earth water. Uh, if it tasted like beer or lemonade, I would think you know something funny has happened, because it should taste like water. So it's not completely clear. Uh, it isn't tasteless, uh, and it's got a kind of waterish color to it. Furthermore, we know it's made out of H2O, and since we now know that, we've redefined the word water as H2O. Indeed, if you look in the dictionary, which I did, you will find, along with a checklist, H2O listed as one of the uh, features of the definition of water. So water is H2O by definition, now, now that we know the facts. It's a case where knowledge of the facts led us to redefine uh, the terms. And I think this is true wherever you have a natural kind. If you discover what's ca causally responsible uh, for the surface features, you'll redefine uh, the, the phenomenon in terms of the underlying cause. So solidity we now define as uh, the vibratory uh, uh, movement of uh, molecules in lattice structures. That's become our e essential feature of solidity instead of it's feeling solid and looking solid and resisting pressure. We, we carve off uh, the surface features which used to define uh, the word and redefine the word in terms of the underlying essential causal structure. Uh, okay, so I, I think Putnam's right about that. So there are two different questions. One question is, is it right to think that the way words are defined, the way we fix the meaning of the word, is by giving a checklist of general terms, clear, colorless, tasteless, liquid? And I think Putnam's right. That's a mistake. I mean, uh, Aristotle's responsible for this. Aristotle said, you remember, man is by definition a rational animal. Well, that won't do, because there are lots of humans that are not rational, and lots of animals that have a, a different degrees of rationality that aren't human. We now define it in terms of, I mean, if we're going to do it, in terms of the number of chromosomes. But it's not a checklist of general terms. But now, there are three different theses. One is, meanings are in the head. That is, what is in the head of the speakers of the language is sufficient to fix meaning. And the second point is, meanings consist in a checklist of general terms. And the third is, meanings are fixed by causal relations uh, to the world. Putnam refuted the second of those. He refuted the view uh, that meanings are given by a checklist of general terms, but he supposed that a refutation of that view refuted the first view, namely that the contents in, in what, of what's in people's heads is sufficient to fix meaning. I think it is sufficient to fix meaning. Uh, but I haven't given you my argument, I'm just giving you these guys' argument. Oh, uh, but I want to make sure everybody's got it, because this is, uh, uh, this is the prevailing orthodoxy in contemporary philosophy, and you ought to know this stuff, uh, even uh, if I'm going to tell you why I think it's mistaken. Let's take a case uh, where it's clear that two people can have exactly the same thing in their heads and mean something different by uttering the same expression. Let's take two identical twins 
and I'll do the usual philosopher's science fiction example, where the identical twins are identical down to the last molecule, the last quark and muon, if you like. They're uh, type identical. And each identical twin says in unison, I am hungry. Now, it's clear that they've each has said something different. They are the same words with the same meanings and some sense of meaning, uh, and they had the same thing in their heads. But twin A is referring to A when he says, I am hungry, and twin B is referring to B when he says, I am hungry. What's going on here? This is not a mystery. This is a perfectly ordinary, everyday example. The answer is, these expressions are indexical. That means the expression gets its reference by being indexed to the context of the utterance. The expression I refers to whoever utters it. Now think about that for a minute. When I say I, I refer to me. When you say I, you refer to you, even though the word I is not ambiguous. It doesn't have different meanings for every person. It has the same meaning throughout, but it has an indexical meaning and, and you can characterize by that, that indexical meaning by saying, I refers to whoever utters the expression. The con and now in the jargon that you've learned, the conditions of satisfaction are self-reflexive to the utterance of the expression itself. I refers to the speaker. Now refers to the time of the utterance. Here refers to the place of the utterance. In each case, the fixing of the conditions of satisfaction is relative to the utterance itself. Hence, as we saw in other cases of self-reflexive intentionality, it is a form of self-reflexive intentionality. The determination of the conditions of satisfaction are fixed relative to the utterance of the expression itself. Now, I think what Putnam has shown, and this is my objection to him, is not that meanings aren't in the head, but rather what he's shown is that they're indexical, uh, that the definition is fixed indexically by saying water is whatever has the same structure, bears the relation same liquid to this stuff, where I identify it indexically, where we have what philosophers call an ostensive definition. You actually point to the substance or an example of the substance in question, and you say, let's call this water. Now, of course, th this is an idealization. In fact, words like this evolve over time, uh, and you may get a word with, where, in fact, it uh, really uh, uh, fits two different kinds of things. Indeed, Putnam gives a good example of that. Uh, the word jade. Uh, in fact, it refers to two different kinds of substances, jadeite and nephrite. And for a long time, when people didn't know any chemistry, they didn't know that. In fact, there are two different kinds of jade. So we, we stayed with the same word. Now, if, if, if people went back and forth between here and Twin Earth, we might say there are two different kinds of water. There's H2O and XYZ. But let's give him his uh, example. And let's say, OK, they don't really mean water on Twin Earth. Uh, when they say water, uh, because water means H2O, and they mean something different. They mean X, Y, Z. But that doesn't show that meanings aren't in the head. What it shows is what fixes the meaning is an indexical definition where something is defined relative to a context, relative to a specific experience that people have in the context. Water is defined as the, as the liquid we're now seeing, and that liquid has, uh, we later uh, discover, has a structure H2O. So water is defined as anything that bears, and to use Putnam's jargon here, bears the relation same liquid to this stuff. But now, well, wouldn't you say, well, that gets it out of the head because this stuff is in the real world? No, this stuff is only capable of impacting, only capable of being represented if, we, if it impacts on our nervous system. So if we're going to spell it out in terms of the condition of satisfaction, water is defined as 
whatever is identical in structure with the stuff causing this visual experience, or rather these visual experiences in your head, my head, and anybody else who happens to be looking at the water in question. So I think if we can, we can accept all of Putnam's intuitions, I, and I think they're doubtful. I'm not sure that we would say that it's not really water. If, it would, if we went back and forth and used uh, uh, their water. Uh, in, in the case of water shortages in California, we import water from Twin Earth uh, and use XYZ. We might well use the same word for both, but it doesn't matter. What, let's give him all of in, intuitions. It's not water. It's water. Uh, it's Twin Earth. Uh, uh, it, it's fool's water. Uh, it's not real honest to John water. You can't bottle it and sell it as water. Uh, it won't be passed by the FDA. Let's give them all of that. All the same, it doesn't show that meanings are in the head. Indexical definitions are as much in the head as any other definition. And indeed, the use of indexical expressions, as in, case, uh, as in my example, where one twin says, I am hungry, and the other twin says, I am hungry. They mean something different, even though what's in the head is type identical. Uh, uh, that doesn't show that meanings aren't in the head. It just shows that many meanings are indexical. That is to say, they are token reflexive. They're token reflexive to the very utterance of the expression itself. You might say, but how about the utterance? Uh, that utterance is itself a public event. Well, of course, you have to uh, use words out loud to communicate, but that utterance is itself the expression of an internal mental state. Now, you might think, well, why does it matter? Who cares if it's internal or external? Well, we want to give a coherent account of the mind, and we want to have a basis for cognitive science and we'll only be able to have a basis for cognitive science if we have a well-defined object of study. And the object of study has to be uh, the human brain and its cognitive capacities. So it's very important to get this part correct, otherwise we won't be able to give a coherent causal account of how our intentional states cause our behavior and how uh, objects and states of affairs in the world cause our intentional states. I think cognitive science is impossible uh, if externalism is right, but I don't think externalism is right. So that I've been brief with Putnam. Now I'll go on to Burge, and then we'll come back to Putnam. Questions about this, just to summarize now. Putnam says meanings cannot be in the head, because what's in the head can be exactly the same, and meanings be different. I agree, what's in the head can be exactly the same, and meanings can be different, but that's because the meanings are indexical. In the case of the two twins who say, I am hungry, the meanings are different. They say something different, even though what's in the head is the same. Once you appreciate the indexical character of these definitions and the use of the words in question, then it seems to me uh, you, are, uh, you can easily account for Putnam, I'll take a question in a second. You can easily account for uh, Putnam's intuitions on an internalist account. Uh, by the way, where beer is concerned, we live on Twin Earth. Uh, the, the Germans properly define beer according to their uh, beer purity law of 1556 or something. You know, it goes back a while. They've been drinking beer for a while. And they define honest to John beer, I should say honest to Johann beer, uh, as made with barley, malt, hops, and water, right? That ought to be tattooed on everybody's brain. Uh, but now people make beer out of all kinds of crap. I mean, I was in a bar once in St. Louis, and well, I won't tell you, it's too awful. I, I, but avoid, avoid bar fights. That is a very simple moral principle. Uh, <laughs> And a guy ordered me a kind of beer, and I, you see this beer advertised on television, it's very widespread, but it's not real beer. They make it with rice. It's not like the Japanese, they don't have anything else. They have to use rice. But in St. Louis, they're making this stuff with rice. And I wanted to tell this guy in the bar, uh, you know, it's not real beer, but I didn't. I, I, I did not, I, I, I don't get in philosophical arguments in bars, but anyway, he drank this stuff. I, it made me sick to the stomach to watch him drinking it. But anyway, there he did. Uh, uh, so we live on Twin Earth. It's not a real beer. It's, it's a, a sort of a, a Twin Earth beer. Uh, and there are various sorts of imitations that are made 
uh, using various uh, mistaken substances. I had an argument once with a guy, and this really was a nice uh, guy. Uh, he ran a brewery in Colorado. And, and they are capable of making decent beer. They don't always do it. And I asked him, why, why don't you guys make as beer as good as I get in Prague or Munich? And his answer was, look, I can make beer. I, I, it tastes just as good as that. I learned how to make beer in Germany, so I know how to make beer uh, taste like the beer you buy in, in uh, Munich or the beer you buy in Prague. Prague's the best in the world. Well, some of the Belgians are pretty good, I have to tell you that. Uh, a, a buddy said Americans won't, won't buy it. Americans want two things in beer. Uh, they want it to be uh, cheap and light. Well, okay. I don't want to. I, I I wish it were cheap, but it don't, I don't want it to be light. And then I named various uh, successful European beers sold in America, and he just laughed. He said, "What's their percent of the market? You know, his percentage of the market is is vastly greater than the than the sort of uh, obscure beers that you get in local supermarkets made in uh, you know, by intellectuals." Uh, in Southern California or uh, by uh, serious brewers in Munich. Anyway, I didn't mean to get off on this. Uh, uh, this is not a lecture about beer. Okay, that's another lecture. The point I'm making now is Putnam is right to say that what's in the head can be type identical and yet the meaning is different. Condition of satisfaction are different. But that's a familiar point. That's true of all indexicality. Indexicality, by definition, is token reflexive. The conditions of satisfaction are fixed relative to the utterance of the token. Okay, now that's Putnam. Now I still haven't dealt with Burge. We're going to go on to Burge, but first Jennifer has a question. Yeah. yeah. Um, both accounts, on your account and on Putnam's account, indexicality plays a pivotal role. Mm -hmm. But the direction of indexicality, it seems, on, his, on um, Putnam's account is, is sort of my sports and world and it's invariant. Yeah. So it's across worlds. On your account, it's towards the mind. Yeah. It's invariant across minds. Yeah. Well, I, I can't see. I mean, it, they're doing two different things. So meaning is invariant across the world. On my account, you learn the meanings of a word uh, by being a part of a community, and you learn the word. You sh learn to share the meanings of a word with a community. But if you ask, and how does the community get the meaning of the word in the first place, it must be because the community has, uh, the various members of the community have impacts on their nervous systems of stimuli, water, beer, uh, uh, jade, nephrite, all of these other phenomena, and that produces visual and other sorts of experiences, and we use their condition of satisfaction to define the words. So I, I, I don't see the difficulty. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the invariance in the world, the meaning stays state, and the world stays as it is, but you can change your relationship to it. So meaning then has the variation goes within the head. On the internalist account, um, the world can shift in court according to how your internal content shifts. So it doesn't stay stable. I mean, the world starts to morph into different sorts of things. Well, so give me an example. Going to be, the, well, yeah. the example is water. H, yeah. When you start to, in 1750, point to water on mm -hmm. Earth, but you point to water on um, Twitter, and then maybe you find out there's actually two different things, that's a discovery. But the meaning of the words didn't change. The reference of the words didn't change. The world didn't change. Yeah. Your relationships to it did. Well, it depends on how we construe meaning. And if we construe meaning indexically, then, and, and we say, Water is defined as anything that's identical in structure with this indexically identified stuff, then water on Earth means something different from water on Twin Earth, even though what's in the head is the same, uh, because uh, wa that water is defined in terms of what is causing this visual experience, what's causing us to have these experiences, and that's a different substance. So I, I don't see, I mean, I agree there is a different in emphasis, but I don't see that, that it, uh, I don't I see that it creates any problem for either his account or mine, that he's emphasizing, well, they, there's an actual world out there and we have to make our language fit the world. I agree with that. But the only way we can make our language fit the world is by representing the world in our mental states. And, the relation, and those relations are indexical. You have a set of indexical definitions. Anyway, any other questions? Or well, now we're going to go on and struggle with Burge. Uh, I don't think that Putnam's argument 
uh, refutes internalism, uh, but a lot of people think it does. Uh, but So let's go to Burge. Burge says uh, the guy has exactly the same thing in his head in the two cases, uh, and it is not surprising because, of course, it's the same guy. We're, we're not imagining, as we did on Twin Earth, we're not imagining two different people in two different locations. Uh, we're imagining one guy in two different social contexts. In one social context, he uses uh, the word uh, arthritis to refer to his pain, and it turns out what he says is false. In that context, he has a false belief. He falsely believes, I have arthritis. But in the other context, where we change the community, he does have uh, a, a, a belief, but this time it's a true belief. This time he truly believes, we can't say arthritis because that's a word of our language, so we'll invent a new word, say tharthritis. Then in this case, the guy has the true belief that he has tharthritis. Same guy, two different communities. It must be two different beliefs because one belief is false and the other one is true. I, and yet it follows then that the a belief isn't in the head because the same belief can't be both true and false. What's in the head? is true in one community and false in the other community. I have to say, I don't, I'm not impressed by that argument. I, I admire both these guys enormously. They're good friends of mine, um, I, and they're both first-rate philosophers, but I think this is not Burgess' most powerful argument. So let me uh, go through it slowly. It seems to me what the guy corrects when he says, oh, okay, I don't have arthritis, uh, I just have a pain in my thigh. What he corrects is not his understanding of the facts, but rather his use of words. We all want our usage of words to match other people's usage. Uh, you, communication is impossible if you don't share meanings with other people. And the most uh, Anti-conformist people I know uh, tend to be very persnickety when it comes to misusing English. Uh, they want you to use English the way everybody else, or rather, the way you think everybody else, they, everybody else should use it. So what happens in Burge's case is not that the guy has a false belief about this experience, his pain in the thigh. What he has is a false belief about what it's called. Uh, and the guy thinks in one community, he thinks correctly that it's called arthritis, and in the other community, he thinks incorrectly uh, that it's called arthritis. Hence, what he says is true in one community and false in another community. But this is not a case where the content of his belief is fixed by the community. What's fixed by the community is his use of words. And the proof of that is that when he changes and says, oh, okay, I don't have arthritis, what he changes is not his understanding of the fact, but his understanding of the words. He says, oh, arthritis is not used to refer to this kind of thing. Arthritis is only used to refer to inflammations of the joint. See, contrast that case with a guy who really does have a false belief. Imagine that there's an arthritis specialist at the UCLA Medical School, and this guy comes to the conclusion. He thinks, you know, we, for all these centuries, we've used arthritis to name an inflammation of the joints, but I can identify exactly the same syndrome in muscle fibers. I can identify exactly the same etiology. That's a fancy word meaning causation. I can identify the, the same causation in muscle fibers, so I think that uh, arthritis can occur in muscle fibers. Now, that guy holds a false belief. He, later on, scientific research shows, no, it's not really arthritis in these cases. He understands the use of the word perfectly. He understands arthritis. But the first guy did not have a false belief about his pain. He had a false belief about what the pain is called in his community. He thought falsely in Santa Monica that it's called arthritis. He thought truly in twin Santa Monica that it's called arthritis. But this doesn't show that he had two different beliefs about his experience. 
He had two different beliefs about what his experience is called. Let me give you another example of this. When I was a real little kid, uh, I used to love learning new words. And I would then go around using these words uh, without having uh, the faintest idea or having only a very dim idea of what the word meant. And I learned a new word, pregnant. Uh, and I thought it had something to do, roughly speaking, with women being fat. Uh, so I had a friend who was uh, uh, some years older than me. We'll call her Sally. Uh, and she, I was about eight, and she was about 12. And I said in front of Sally's parents, I think Sally's pregnant. Uh, this created enormous consternation uh, to my, that's why I remember it, uh, it uh, to my surprise. Now, did I really believe that Sally was pregnant? No, I didn't believe that. And I think the guy didn't really believe that he had arthritis. He believed that he had something called arthritis. And I, I didn't even have that much of a belief. I just thought, well, she's got some kind of condition that would be fun to call pregnant. Uh, and I got in a lot of trouble uh, for that. But anyway, we did, it, it did get sorted out. And people did not prove Searle held up, they didn't refer to me by my last name then, they did not prove Johnny held a false belief, uh, they proved Johnny doesn't know what he's talking about, and that was in fact the case. So I, this is kind of a spectacular example. Now, this is such an obvious objection to birds that the falsity is not about uh, the, um, I, I, is not the belief about his condition because that's perfectly right. He believes that he has this pain here. Uh, the falsity is a falsity about his belief uh, of what that condition is called in his community. And he believes fal falsely that it's called arthritis. But that's not the content of his belief. That's a linguistic belief. That's a belief about language. Well, anyway, I, I once uh, uh, some years ago, I was teaching this course, and I gave exactly that argument. And they said, well, why don't you call him up? Uh, and ask him what he says to that when you just say, well, it's really just a false belief about words. And I thought, okay, what the hell, I'll call him up. Well, Burge was on sabbatical, he was at a beach house, and the last thing he wanted to hear was some guy in Berkeley calling him about the arthritis example. But anyway, I did discuss it with him, and what he said was very interesting. He said, I'm just going to stipulate that the guy has no metalinguistic beliefs, that he has no beliefs about how words are used. And just stipulate, it's my example, I can do what I want with it. You know, philosophers often miss this, that you, that you get to decide in your example what the features of the example. There's always some kid, there's always some philosophers like the kid who when the teacher said, let X be the number of sheep, the kid, the philosophical kid said, but suppose X isn't the number of sheep. Well, the teacher gets to decide if X is the number of sheep. So Burge gets to decide his example, and he decides that the guy has no metalinguistic beliefs. However, I don't think that's an adequate answer to the question. Why? Well, you know that by now. It's background. Of course, the guy may not have to go around writing mental dictionaries, arthritis is defined, blah, 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 but he does have to have a background disposition to use language in a way that matches the usage of his community. He has to take, you can't speak a language without a background commitment to using words uh, the way they're used in your community. And if you discover that one of your usages doesn't match the community, uh, you have to change the usage if you're going to succeed in communicating. So I'll give Burge his claim that the guy need not have any explicit metalinguistic beliefs. All the same, the guy has to have a background disposition to use words in a way that matches the community. And when he discovers that the word, are, uh, that, uh, 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 the word he's using doesn't match, the usage in his community, that arthritis doesn't match the usage of the community, he'll change the use of the words. But I, the, what I've been saying to you is the guy does not have a false belief that he has arthritis. He has a true belief that he has a pain in his thigh, and he falsely believes that it's called arthritis. But the content, the actual content of his belief is about the pain in the 
thy. And the other belief is a metalinguistic belief. And he need not formulate it explicitly, but like everybody who talks, he has to make some assumptions about how his usage matches other people's usages. So I am not convinced by either uh, Burge or Putnam. Putnam shows us the indexical component uh, in our use of language, and I want to say it's actually even stronger uh, than he allows for, because all of our uses of words and all of our thoughts and indeed our perceptions are indexed to the background, are indexed to our set of background abilities and to our network of uh, beliefs and assumptions and so on. You can only use language, and indeed you can only think uh, if the thought content that you have going through your heads has its interpretation fixed by a set of capacities that are not parts of the thought content. So I think it was useful uh, that Putnam got rid of the idea that meanings are strictly matters of a, a checklist of general terms. Water is a clear, uh, colorless, tasteless liquid. But I don't think it shows that the contents of the brain are insufficient to fix the condition of satisfaction. Once you understand that the condition of satisfaction are typically fixed indexically, and indeed that the index uh, often involves both the background and the network, then I don't see any real problem with his examples. Now he has some other examples that I should tell you about, but let's take questions about, uh, about that. He's got another argument, uh, which I think is not very powerful either, but here's how it goes. Uh, let's suppose, as indeed is the case, uh, that he lives in a community where there are lots of big deciduous trees. Uh, he lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Cambridge is uh, full of large deciduous trees. And let's suppose that he knows that some of these are elms and some of these are beaches. But now, what's in his head for elm and beach is pretty much the same. He's no expert on elms uh, and beaches. He, he thinks, Putnam thinks correctly, that we yield to experts when a whole lot, where a whole lot of words are uh, used. I, I don't know the chemical composition of nicotine. If I was asked to define nicotine, I couldn't tell you, but I can tell you it's a bad stuff in cigarettes, and I rely on the experts to be able to define it. But now, here's how the argument goes. When he says elm, he means elm. And when he says beach, he means beach. But what's in the head isn't sufficient to determine that, because what's in the head is the same for elm and beach. So elm and beach would, be, uh, the, uh, would have to be the same species of tree if meanings were in the head and meanings were sufficient to determine conditions of satisfaction. What's in the head doesn't determine conditions of satisfaction. It's something like the experts, or the experts' use of the words here. I, uh, so does everybody see this argument? The argument goes, I, I know uh, that there is a big species of tree called elm, a species of big tree called elm, and another one called beech. What I have in the head, my concept of elm, is the same as my concept of beech, but all the same, elms are not beeches. So if you were going to do this, you'd have to say, my concept of elm, concept of elm is the same as my concept of beech. Uh, but all the same, I know that they're not the uh, the same tree because I know I know elms are not beeches and beeches are not elms. But now, since what's in the head is the same and yet I have different reference, I have different extension, then what's in the head can't determine extension. Uh, I don't think that's a very impressive argument, but he does use it. Uh, and the answer to it's very simple. Uh, part of what I know when I, I have uh, the use of the word elm 
to name a type of tree, and when I have the use of the word beech to name a type of tree, what I have is a certain conceptual knowledge, and this is put by the statement, I know that elms are not beeches and beeches are not elms. That is, this is conceptual. It's a matter of my having these concepts. Well, how can that be if the concepts are the same? Well, they can't be exactly the same because part of my concept of elm, feeble as it is, I, is it's a separate species. Are we running out of time? How, are we a clean out? Oh my, I know it's wrong, but is it that wrong? Oh, okay. I, well, I finish, let me finish the damn sentence, okay? Uh, if I can remember where it was in the sentence. I cannot, I mean, it's a, yeah, it, it's a form of interruptus if I walk away in the middle of a sentence. I, I, the, the point I want to make is that if you give him what he wants, then the argument's contradictory. Because this second argument says it's conceptual knowledge. But that means that the concepts are not the same. Uh, this is false. Because part of my concept is of elm is separate species of tree different from beech, and part of my concept of beech is separate species of tree different from elm. Uh, okay, I'll see you on Tuesday.